l'invitation. J'ai un texte très très bien préparé par nos services, euh, donc je vais décevoir quelques collègues présents parce que après l'introduction de Monsieur Leclerc, je ne peux pas me passer de, de réagir sur ses commentaires euh, parce que je crois qu'on est dans une période de, euh, existentielle pour la pluriformité de nos sociétés. Pas moins que ça. Um, if you take a look at um, societies across Europe and the relationship between the powers that be and journalism and media. By the way, it's always a bit awkward for a politician to talk about the media, but, um, you know, um, hens, hens usually don't talk about the foxes, do they? Um, <laughs> But um, I, think, I think there is an interesting parallel. Um, look at where political models are being developed that um, uh, maintain that you can have democracy without the rule of law or with a rule of law that is guided uh, by the powers that be uh, without full respect for human rights or human rights that are conditional to what the powers that be want. This is a very fundamental challenge to the way Europe, the free Europe, was constructed after uh, the end of the Second World War and then was expanded after the end of the European divide. The whole model rests on the tripod of respect for dem a democratic vote, the rule of law, and human rights, and one should not be used against the other. Now, isn't it interesting that in those nations where um, politicians maintain that because you win an election, you also get to dictate the rules in the rule of law, but you also get to pretend those who did not win the elections no longer take part. In those nations, journalism, free journalism, independent journalism is always under threat which proves that independent journalism is an essential element of, this, of maintaining this tripod I was speaking about earlier, a tripod which, in my view, is essential if we want to maintain our open societies, our pluriform societies, and the societies based on the rule of law and the respect for human rights. This is only one aspect, sadly, of the challenge germ uh, journalism faces today. I'm sure many people here in this room know much more than I do about the new media and the developments there. But I am a father, and I know that my children find it odd that you should pay for information. Whereas the information we get is uh, intellectual property, and it represents a value, um, a public value, and therefore should be also represented in terms of cost, and people should be um, prepared to pay for it. And I think I need to teach my children still, and their generation, that this is something that we will have to face sooner or later, if we value the public service that is essential to maintain open societies and pluriform societies and democratic societies. Now, to do that, we need to find new models. Um, and I think you can, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it. We're here at the Commission to support you in that. And I will be personally strongly in favour of, of, of projects that help this come about. And I know that initially where we still saw a confrontation between what we used to call old media and new media, now all media understand that this is about their collective futures as independent um, providers of a public service, a very important public good. So the economic model that was always based on advertising and advertising was necessary because companies had no other ways or no better ways to reach their customers, that model is gone, it's not coming back. So we need to find other models. And these models were always national and we need to understand that this is no longer just a national issue, transnational. And I've said very often that we don't have a European demos, that this is still nationally organized. But I think I need to challenge my own words on that, because if I've seen anything in the last 
year or two is a growing understanding that we're all in this boat together and that even a Dutch election can have importance for the rest of Europe, um, let alone a French election or a German election or an Italian election. So in that, and that when there is a problem with women's rights in Poland, this affects all women in Europe. If there's a problem with academic freedom in Hungary, this is something all Europeans worry about. This is new. This is new. Um, Hungary is a case in point. I think, I think Prime Minister Orban was quite surprised that there was so much attention for what is happening in Hungary and that also that there was so much knowledge about what was happening because for many, many years he could play this interesting game of presenting one image of himself in Brussels and a different image of himself in Hungary assuming that nobody would translate what he would say in Hungary. Um, and that he could edit at home what he said in Brussels, which he did very often when he came to the European Parliament. That sort of doesn't work anymore. And that's one of the reasons why I'm optimistic about your future and our future in an open society. I think we've reached a tipping point. I think the American election was very important in that. I think it was important that journalists came to reappraise their role. You know, it's very clear, you said so earlier, and you're absolutely right. Over the last decade, 15 years, we've let ourselves, we Europeans, pro-Europeans, be intimidated by the anti-Europeans. Their determination to destroy the European Union is much stronger than our determination to defend it and fight for it. Slowly, I see this changing. Their determination to attack journalists as people with a bias was much stronger than the determination of the journalistic profession to defend itself against those allegations. Intimidated. We got it wrong. Oh my God, we missed populism. We got it wrong. I saw that in my own country very clearly. And then we reached a point also in the United States where the Polls and politics also drove journalists to reconsider their own assumptions, but at some point we, we reached the stage where opinions and facts were confused and were given the same value in the public debate. And if you said the earth was flat, that opinion would get the same value as somebody who would contest that allegation. And I now see in the United States and in Europe, sort of a renewed vigor to get the facts out and to not accept this premise that if I have an opinion that doesn't, isn't corroborated by the facts, then I could just get alternative facts to make sure that my opinion um, stays on the table. And I think this is a, a fundamental societal development. It's not just about politics and populism. It's about our um, extended egos where feelings and opinions, even at an individual level, become more and more important. And to be corrected by the facts is something you don't want to do. And politicians like myself are certainly partly to blame for that. Because if people said we don't feel safe, we would kill them with statistics and PowerPoint presentations telling them they were wrong. But yeah, but we don't feel this. And one of the expressions that impressed me greatly years ago, when Mr. Wilders in my country for the first time had a, a, a quite a big electoral success. Journalists went into the village in the province of Brabant, where he had a huge success in a place called Rukven. And they asked the lady, did you vote for Wilders? And at the time, you know, people were still a bit reluctant to admit that they voted for Wilders. That's changed. But... And she said, yeah, yeah, I voted for him. And then she was defensive, and before the journalist could ask a question why, she said, you know, you know, I know it isn't true what he says, but he's absolutely right. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but there's a profound truth in this, which affects my profession just as much as your profession. If people feel ignored, or if people feel that their feelings are not taken seriously. At some point, they would even dis disregard the mo most fundamental facts if they believe those facts are presented by people
who don't want to listen to them. And I think there's much of that going on in the French election now as well, if you look at the charts, who votes what where. I talk a lot and I write a lot about journalism. I even wrote a whole chapter in a book about journalism uh, because I, I attach so much importance to it. I always get upset. You know, people, people in the Netherlands know that. They know me very well. Some journalists say, why do you always get so upset when we say something that isn't right? Um, and I said, because I take you so bloody seriously. Too seriously, perhaps, but that's my default. But look, and I want to go to what for me is the core of the matter. If you know anything about European history, you know that manipulating the truth, directing sentiment, creating enemies, scapegoats, is something we Europeans do extremely well. And we have only a few guardians of the galaxy who know how to tackle that. And one of the most effective and most necessary is journalism. And I know that in the present economic model, journalism is very often, even from part of the press, too expensive. So what do you do? What is cheap? Commentary is cheap. I can write a blog in an hour or two, a decent blog, and I can fill newspaper with blogs and commentaries. But the essence of, of journalism is, is to go after the facts, to put these facts in an order that people can understand, to annotate the facts, to analyze them, and then only give commentary if you want on the facts. And I think we have a huge, huge collective task, the public sector and journalism, to revisit our educational systems across the European Union. Because the illiteracy of the future is not not being able to read or write. The illiteracy of the future is not to be able to learn and to distinguish, to select. Because that is one of the downsides of the internet age, is that where we, in the process of looking for things, we needed to select and discard. Because finding something in the past before internet was extremely difficult. And the process in our educational systems was always geared toward helping people to find things. And that taught people how to select. The easiest thing in the world now is to find something. I can find anything I want on this small device here in my pocket. Anything. But do I then understand what I've found? Can I put it in a context? Can I analyze it? Can I select what is true and what is not true, etc., etc.? No, I can't. And if there's no joint effort, no joint, if there's no joint effort between our educational systems and journalism to fix that problem, then I think you can sell any nonsense to the people in the future because they can no longer have the critical thinking capacity that is necessary. So what is the illiteracy of the future? The illiteracy of the future is the loss of critical thinking, the loss to learn new things. And I believe that here, I don't want to, you know, sort of send you away with this feeling, oh my God, how are you ever going to do that? But I think there is a, an incredible role for journalists here and for journalism. And that's why I believe in the amalgamation of new media, old media, of new uh, uh, internet-driven, uh, technological-driven ideas. And where we can as Commission, we will support them. I want to be part of those labs. I want to be part of those experiments. Not because I want you to say what a wonderful job the Commission does. Um, the more I ask for it, the less I'll get. Um, and I know I said this once in a seminar um, with, with a couple of journalists. And it's, it's an old joke which I refurbished in, uh, in European way. If, if Jean-Claude Juncker were to walk by the um, pond in Wallue and somebody would be drowning and he would see that and he would walk over the water and save the person, walk back over the water, put them on the side. I'm sure the headlines next day in the newspapers would be Jean-Claude Juncker can't swim. Um, uh, I know, but... That's not the point. It's not the point how we relate. It's the point how we see our roles in society in the future. And there I believe if we don't reinvent the noble art of journalism in the modern context, 
we don't just lose a profession and an economic activity, we lose the very fabric of our democratic, pluriform, open societies. You can see it whether you look at Turkey, in Russia, sometimes in EU member states such as now Hungary and Poland. It's not by accident that the media are targeted as one of the first actions when the so-called illiberal ideology takes a hold. So that's what we're fighting for, not for this building or the EU. And that's, by the way, and I'll end on that. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I feel passionate about this. That blue flag with gold stars, it doesn't represent the Berlin Mall, the European Parliament, or the opportunity to be a blue book trainee or to get subsidies from the structural funds. To people in Budapest when they carry that flag, to people in Kiev when they carry that flag, to people in Warsaw or in Paris or in London for that matter who carry that flag, it represents values, not a common currency, not open borders, not a common market. It represents values, the values of equality, of openness, of honesty, of truth. And those values can only be carried in a society if they are underpinned by journalism. Thank you very much for your attention.